Hey guys, welcome back to my channel where I cover nostalgic, obscure, or otherwise strange content. Today we are revisiting a TV show that I covered really early on on this channel. I think it was like the second video ever. That show is Beyond Belief Fact or Fiction. It was a show that ran in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, basically they would give you five stories throughout the course of the show and then you'd have to guess at the end which ones were real stories and which ones were just made up by the writers. What appears to be one thing, like this carving of a duck, might really be another. Like the carving of a rabbit. And it was damn near impossible to guess, but... <laughs> I was a big fan of that show, and you guys seem to like the video I did a while back. And one of the viewers actually commented and reminded me about the episode that we're going to be talking about tonight. So thank you for that, uh, because this episode is phenomenal. I love this episode. Now, the only bad news I have is that this particular episode um, was not um, hosted by our boy, Jonathan Frakes. Aww. But th there is good news. Uh, it was hosted by James Brolin. <laughs> I just, I love this show. I love this show so much, so let's just get right into it. Play along, by the way. Uh, try to guess, if you can, which ones of these stories are true and which ones are false. A disturbing piece of furniture, isn't it? The last bed we will ever sleep in. That's a way to put that, yes. So our first story is about a boy whose family runs a funeral home. Very, very cheery. Brett? Brett, are you in here? Nah. nah. It was just a joke. You know you're not supposed to be fooling around in the coffins. Ah, oh, come on. Don't be such a stiff. That was a terrible pun. Oh, no. Has anyone seen my keys? Has anyone seen my keys? Oh, uh, he was uh, fooling around in the coffins. Well, I was not. Adam's lost his sense of humor. Has anyone seen my keys? Brent, I've told you before, stay out of the caskets. They're for sale. Yes, yeah, stay out of the coffins. Not because uh, this could potentially scar you for life, have a lasting impact on you as a human being, but because this is the family merchandise. Don't break it. I'm sorry, we're closed. Uh, Mr. Foster, it's Beverly Ham. I'm sorry. Calling so late. I was wondering... Could we possibly postpone my husband's funeral tomorrow? Can you imagine calling the funeral home to try to, like finish making arrangements for your loved one's funeral the next day and in the background there's just this like mom he took my game boy i don't want to go to dinner has anyone seen my keys you see before reginald died he made me promise to bury him with his war medals now i can't find them any place i'm not sure that i can contact everyone <laughs> They were in his pocket the whole time. Now, Mrs. Yes. Hannon, I, I know how important this is to you, but <laughs> if you keep looking for them, I'm, I'm sure that you will find them. I know this is the final request of your late husband, but I'm not gonna do anything to fix it for you because I have dinner to go to. So they leave the teenage boy home alone with dead bodies. I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm sorry, we're closed. You need to see Reginald Hannon. I I'm sorry, sir, viewing hours ended at 7.30. All right, so this dude shows up in the middle of the night and he's like, yo, I have the medals that this guy needed. My cat is starting the video, give me a second. So this guy shows up in the middle of the night and he's like, yo, I have those medals that this guy is supposed to be buried with. Can I please get in uh, to give them to him? So the kid lets this guy in. Would you mind if I had a moment alone? He just hits the sign and then is surprised when something falls off of it. Like, what did you think was gonna happen? This is pivotal. I see why they left this bit in here. So he gets tired of waiting for this guy to come out of the chapel, so he goes in. Hello? Come on, mister. I was nice enough to let you in in the first place. Hey mister, I know this is one big empty hallway and I can literally see everything I need to in my peripheral vision, but I'm looking around because I don't know where you went. That's when I found the bag that the medals were in. And plot twist, the guy who found the medals was the dead guy all along. So that's story number one. Uh, make your decisions now about whether or not you 
think it was real or fake as we move on to the next story. I will say, I'm if I died and had to carry out my final wishes for my own funeral as a ghost, I would be super pissed. I'd be like, do I have to do everything around here? <laughs> okay, so our next story is about a couple um, that is going out for a date night and they get on the LA subway system. Oh, we won't be out late, okay? Dinner, a movie, that's all. Then we'll go home. <laughs> yeah, after midnight. The husband is a total mood for me. I very much relate to that. <laughs> hey, band leader? Undertaker. He does seem a little bit odd, but maybe don't point and laugh. I think he can hear you and see you. Are we on the right train? I don't know. Um, excuse me, does this train go to Melrose? Yeah. This train goes nowhere. Oh. Okay, thanks. Of course, there was no conductor anywhere. Every car was empty, and then without any warning, the train began to speed up. Oh god, it's making me, like, motion sick looking at it. So the train starts freaking out and going haywire, and right when they think they're never going to get off of the train, the train just stops back at the station that they started from, and they're just like, alright, let's just go home. Hi, Perry. This is my kitty, Perry. We got her as a foster and then kept her. Foster animals at your local shelter if you can. Uh-oh, I don't like that. I don't trust that guy. So they get back to their apartment building and they realize that they smell gas from coming from their neighbor's apartment. <laughs> my cat just changed the light on my clock. Did you see that? This is Ewing! This is Ewing! Hang on, I see that you're knocking on that door, but step aside so that I can knock on the door in the exact same way. That'll help. <laughs> And then I remember the key. Wait, 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 the key! The key. Oh, the key. <laughs> a chain! This is Ewing! Usually I would complain about how they make breaking down doors seem so easy on TV, but in this one they just, they just make it painfully obvious how cumbersome it would be in real life. But the good news is they saved the neighbor's life, and in the process, uh, they figure out who that creepy guy on the train was. <sighs> this is Ewing. <sighs> who is this? That's Edward, my husband. He passed away 29 years ago. He said he'd always watch over me. Was there no better way for Edward to have done that? He had to make them fear for their lives in order to save his wife's life. All right, so that's story number two. Now let's move on to story number three. Story number three is the specific story that one of my viewers um, brought this episode up because of, because apparently this episode, this story, scarred them for life. Um, much like um, the one in the last video that I did about Beyond Belief uh, did to me uh, when I was a kid, so... So, uh, original commenter, if you're watching and you, um, you don't want to rehash old memories, um, you might just want to skip past this particular part of the video. My youngest son, Danny, was 10 years old and living in constant terror. His days were filled with threats and taunts from the kids at school. So this poor kid is getting bullied at school because he thinks there's a monster in his closet, which is strange because don't all kids think there's a monster in their closet at some age? I, I thought that. Was there a monster in my closet? But correct me if I'm wrong, I've never known any kid to be bullied in this manner. The kids chase him from school to his front door every single day, his entire class, including his older brother. And where did he come from? He just yeeted out of the bushes. You have got to get over this. But I'm afraid to. I know. But mom, I'm scared. Look, I literally don't care that you're eight. You need to grow up. Great parenting, Mom. Here. Let's see. Here, no, no. No, let's check up this sleeve here. Nothing's gonna get you. Very ominous way to say that when you're trying to calm a child down. Oh, and um, if you don't stay in bed, I'm gonna get you. I don't feel like it's fair to say to a kid, hey, I know you're scared for your life right now uh, but because I don't believe you uh, 
you're not allowed to leave the room that you're scared of. And I'm gonna turn off all the lights and make it look super creepy in here. But I'm not a parent, so what do I know? That monster did not wait a split second more than he had to, as soon as the mom was out of the door. He didn't miss a single beat, he was just like, Hello, I am the monster in your closet. And I'm British for some reason. I'm so sorry to my British viewers. There's a monster in the refrigerator. Right, why would you just stop it? You should be thankful you don't have an imagination like your brother Danny. So not only does this poor kid have to deal with being terrified to sleep, uh, but also his two older siblings bully him just openly. Mom, everybody's laughing at him at school. All right, all right, all right, that's enough. Why is everyone making fun of him at school? That feels like such a big reaction that kids wouldn't have to something like that. I don't know. Like, look at this. The poor kid's running for his life. Yeah. I'm paddling you guys. Oh my god, you've pushed Danny over the edge. He snapped. I'll take you all on. Oh, poor Danny. So the kids try to trap Danny in the closet that he's so scared to be in. And the big sister is like, hey, this is messed up. Maybe don't do that. But then they're just like, nah, we're going to do that anyway. And the big sister's just like, okay. Uh, but then Danny tells his brother, who is actively bullying him, you get in the closet if you think there's nothing in there. And how do you think that's going to go? Apparently the big brother just got like incinerated by whatever was in the closet. Damn. Danny's brother was never seen or heard from again. Oh my god. I see why this episode was so disturbing. Oh my goodness. I don't remember seeing this one when I was younger, but if I had, I don't think I ever would have slept in my room ever again. So our next story is uh, about a guy who's on trial for murdering his business partner. Not the cheeriest show beyond belief. So the first part of the story is just normal, like, court TV mumbo jumbo, where people are taking the stand and being like, ma, he did it, ma. <laughs> uh, but then they have the accused take the stand, and that's really where the main plot of this one kicks in. That camera work. Goodness. The prosecution is trying to make the case that you killed your friend and business partner. I could never do that. Don't you hate it when the person you killed in cold blood shows up to your murder trial? They're not gonna buy it, Robert. They all know you're lying. Why are you lying, Robert? I'm not lying. You would have been nothing without me. What do you mean she would have been nothing without you? So this guy who's a murderer, so he's already a, you know, a terrible person, uh, gets really easily baited into this argument with a ghost. You always did this to me. You always, you always, your honor, this is an outrage. And after he basically just flat out confesses in front of everybody, the jury finds him not guilty by reason of insanity. You find the defendant, Robert Elgin Miller, not guilty by reason of insanity. Which, I'm sorry, but no, <laughs> that shouldn't be how it works. This ghost had to show up to her own murder trial just to get a confession out of this guy, and then they let him off the hook after he confessed? Gosh, I'm learning that ghosts have to do a lot <laughs> from the afterlife. They have a lot of responsibilities, apparently. Between the guy that had to find his own medals of honor, and the guy that had to save his wife from dying, you know, on the train, and then this lady. Very stressful being a ghost. <laughs> Was it strained nerves? or a guilty conscience that trapped the killer? Or did Robert actually see the woman he murdered? Now, prior to taking the stand, he seemed perfectly calm and collected, yet moments later, he was carrying on bizarre conversations with an unseen presence. Or perhaps it was all just a clever ploy to avoid the death penalty. And the writers make James Brolin do the same thing. They made Jonathan Frakes do when he was the host, uh, which is to make him like throw out a suggestion like yeah this probably makes sense right and you're like yeah 
that sounds about right to me as the viewer watching at home. And then he comes back and he's like, Maha, you forgot about this thing. You dumb idiot. It couldn't be that now, could it? And you're just like, I guess you're right. I'm very sorry. That's a funny choice on behalf of the writers, though. Not the, not either of the hosts. They're both great hosts. <laughs> okay, and our last story tonight is about a girl that goes to help her grandpa, um, who's sick, run his farm. But the stroke had left him without the use of his legs, and he had too much time to sit around and think about dreams that would never come true. I knew I used to be his favorite. And I was looking forward to returning some of the love and attention he showed me when I was a child. Aw, well that's nice. You know, the favorite grandkid going to help the grandpa. It's sweet. Grandpa, it's me! You don't have to yell, I can hear you. I'm not deaf, I had a stroke. You scared me. Don't you knock? You're lucky I recognize that I shot you. Well, all my warm, fuzzy feelings are going away pretty quickly. Stay out of my way. I want you to know I don't need you here. You were the favorite grandchild? What was he like to the other grandkids that weren't his favorite? <laughs> so she goes about trying to help her grandfather with his daily life, and he's a big, grumpy pants. That's the worst coffee I ever tasted. Hey, use your words. So the farm is in financial trouble, um, and the granddaughter has found a buyer for part of their land, and Grandpa's not very happy about that. You happy now? Got what you want? What makes you so bitter? Why do you think you can come here and mess up my life? You think I want to be here? You don't even like me, Grandpa. You have been nothing but mean to me since I walked through that door. Well, then leave. And so after they have this fight, she storms off to go ride the tractor. Yee yee. And uh-oh, she doesn't really know how to drive the tractor, apparently. I love that you can clearly see in the first shot that she fell back and caught herself and didn't even hit her head or anything, but then in the next shot, she's just like lying flat, out cold on the ground. And Grandpa redeems himself for being the jerk that he's been this whole time by managing to not only walk out the door, but miraculously, he stops the tractor before it just flattens his granddaughter and then maybe dies, I'm not sure what happens to grandpa after that let's say he didn't die that sounds better and she just calmly wakes up her hair and makeup looks very good for having just almost fallen to her death a final act of love by a man who seemed to have no love left why did they make james brolin sit on hay bales they didn't need to do that <laughs> okay so now we're at the end now we get to figure out uh which stories really happened and which ones didn't. And like I said, they make it so difficult to tell. But, I mean, just off of principle, this first one seems a little far-fetched to me. Did a story like this really take place? Yes, it did. Oh, never mind. I guess that one was real. Okay, well, if they said the first one was real, then I feel like the second one might be real. Real. Would it surprise you to learn that this story was inspired by an actual experience? It was. All right. And what's your guess on the story about the boy who feared the monster in his closet? I really hope this one isn't real because if that original commenter that brought up this episode is watching, I don't want them to like relive the emotional turmoil that is this episode all over again. Let's say, let's say it's false. Could the idea for a story like this have come from a real life event? Yes, it did. Uh oh. Ah, uh, hmm, hmm. Moving on. And what's your verdict on the defendant and the ghost he confronted in the courtroom? Now see, stories like this, I genuinely feel like that could happen because it's entirely possible that somebody just pretended to be crazy to get out of having to go to jail. Did this seem like a clever tale crafted by the mind of a writer out to fool you? That's what it was. But no, that one was the one that was completely made up. I'm also going to guess that this one could have happened because stuff like this does actually happen. If you thought that story really happened, we got you. And that one was made up too. So I got one right out of all five of those. Let me know in the comments if you did any better than I did. I loved this show as a kid. I still love this show. It's 
exactly the kind of thing I love to talk about on this channel. So if you have any episodes that you want me to cover in future videos, uh, let me know and I will make a point to do that in the future because uh, I definitely want to do more videos about Beyond Belief. But that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for liking, commenting, subscribing, sharing. Anything you do to support this channel is so appreciated. I'm, I'm so grateful. Remember, my name is Avery. I'm a YouTuber if you say so, because thanks to you guys, this is technically a YouTube channel. Bye.